Pete Early discovers that his son has a mental illness and wants to get him treatment, only to learn that there are many challenges with the American mental health industry. Hi, I'm Michael Cahill, and today I'm going to share some problems with America's mental health system that are highlighted in Pete Early's book, Crazy, A Father's Search Through America's Mental Health Madness. Problem number one, people with mental illness have the right to be crazy. Early son, Mike, was an adult when he began showing signs of mental illness, which is a common age when most mental illness symptoms appear. Early recognized that his son, Mike, was acting strange and wanted him to get psychiatric treatment. At the hospital, the ED doctor said that he could not help unless Mike consented to treatment. Since Mike was an adult, he had the right to refuse to care, leaving Early powerless. Mike's ED doctor pointed out that under Virginia's law, it would be illegal to treat mental illness without consent. Treatment of mental illness cannot be forced until a patient hurts himself or someone else. A patient can only be involuntarily committed when the patient breaks the law. Unfortunately, Mike later breaks the law when his mental health illness spirals out of control. Problem number two, getting arrested does not guarantee mental illness treatment. After Mike breaks into a stranger's house, the police could not force Mike into a mental health treatment facility. Early had to lie to a social worker stating that Mike had threatened to kill him in order to have his own son voluntarily committed. Under Virginia law, Early had to appear in court within 48 hours to explain why Mike needed to be hospitalized, otherwise Mike could be released. Once hospitalized, the law protected Mike, allowing him to refuse medications. Mike thought the medications were poison, so he would not take the psychiatric medications, which would have helped him think clearly. Mike later is issued two felony warrants that carried a $10,000 fine and a five-year prison sentence. Mike's criminal history later prohibits him from finding a job and living a normal life. Early studies the success of a mental health patient, Freddie Gilbert, who received a six-month treatment of therapy in trying out psychotropic medications after being arrested. After treatment, Early saw that Gilbert became a well-groomed and coherent patient. Gilbert has schizophrenia and was originally arrested for being a sanitary nuisance. However, he was lucky enough to go to a mental health treatment. Three days after being discharged to a boarding house, Gilbert returned to the streets and stopped taking his psychotropic medications. This example shows that forcing is not always a solution. It also shows that there should be programs to help transition mental health patients back to society after receiving treatment. Problem number three, insurance companies control treatment of mental illness. When Mike is hospitalized and voluntarily seeks treatment for his mental illness, Early learns that Mike's insurance company is putting pressure on the hospital to release Mike. Mike's insurance company stated that three to four days should be enough time to become mentally stable for discharge. Mike's insurance company stated that Mike did not need to be in a locked mental ward and that the law requires that he be held in the least restrictive environment possible. Early later learns that only prison inmates with health insurance get legal help and that the public defenders will push to release an inmate even if they're not mentally safe. Mike later gets a job when he qualifies for medical coverage through an HMO. His new insurance re requires him to switch to his psychiatrist who is not familiar with his medical history. The new psychiatrist suggests that he switch his antipsychotic medication which had been helping him because it was a placebo in her opinion. Early also points out how cuts in Medicaid funding are affecting the mental ill. Medicaid will only pay for the cheapest generic brands of psychotropic medications even if they had even if they are not as effective. He also cites how a man with mental illness was denied coverage for an exact dose of Zyprexa because a Medicaid software program identified his order as a double order and automatically changed his dose. Problem number four. Prisons have become mental hospitals because a number of untreated people with mental illness end up in prison. Early notes the high number of patients with mental illness who are in a Miami prison and learns that on an average day, 700 inmates in the Miami jail system take antipsychotic drugs. He cites how the prisons are overcrowded. He shadows an overworked chief psychiatrist, Dr. Poitier, who has so many patients that he can only spend about 12.7 seconds with each patient. Early also notices that the prison guards do not receive mental illness training, and as a result, some of the guards become frustrated and, and end up abusing patients. The jails also control the distribution of medications to the prisoners. 
early learns that the prison he visits will automatically switch a person's antipsychotic medication to cheaper medications, which can lead to a prisoner's relapse and mental illness. Early learns that the guards are administering the medications to prisoners. Early cites one patient was moved off a psychiatric floor of a jail because his mental illness was stable. Once on the new unit, the guards forgot to give the patient his psychiatric medication, which led the patient to relapse and almost commit suicide. The fifth problem is society does not understand mental illness. Early shares his experience with his son's arrest for breaking into a stranger's house. After Mike was arrested, Early was appealing to have the two felonies dropped. However, the owner of the house that was broken into pushed for a more severe punishment. The owner did not want to forgive Mike for making her feel like a victim rather than see Mike as a victim of mental illness. This misunderstanding led Mike to, lead, to plead guilty to a misdemeanor, which later made it difficult for Mike to find work and move on to a normal life. Early cites that some civil groups, such as American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, make it difficult for people with mental illness to find treatment. Kendra's law allows people to involuntarily commit someone to a mental hospital who meets certain criteria, such as having a history of violence. When Kendra's law was being passed, the ACLU fought the enactment because they feared people would be force-fed, mind-altering drugs, and herded up off the streets. Early's, early interviews a prisoner with mental illness named Carl and asked if he would be upset if someone took him off the streets and force-fed him medicine. Carl replied, yes and no. I would have been angry and fought, but if they stuffed pills down my throat, I would have kissed their asses and thanked them once I got my mind back, because no one wants to be crazy like that. This example shows that humane groups are trying to help preserve the rights of people, but they end up ultimately denying people treatment with mental illness. Society's law enforcement also lacks an understanding of mental illness. Early reveals how law enforcement officers lack formal training and education in working with citizens who have mental illness. Early cites a few stories of how people with mental illness end up being beaten or killed by police when they're having psychotic breaks. Early finds that some officers volunteer to take crisis intervention training, CIT. CIT is a special training that police officers can learn in order to better serve civilians with mental illness. Unfortunately, CIT is not required, leaving people with mental illness at risk of abuse or death during a psychotic break. The shortcomings of the mental health system in America highlighted in this presentation are overwhelming. As an ER nurse, I care for many patients with mental illness that are having psychotic breaks. I have come to know some of these patients by name because they end up in the ER so often. I have witnessed myself and other staff members sometimes becoming a little exacerbated. I have helped these patients be sent to mental health facilities only to see them end up back in the ER a few days later. After reading this book, I have a better understanding of the challenges these patients and their families face. This understanding has helped me to find more compassion for my patients with mental illness. It has also motivated me to work with my hospital on ways to better serve our mental health clients. Thank you for your time.